Welcome back to another episode of the e-learning series on GFSM, the Government Finance Statistics Manual. In this episode, I will introduce the statistical approach to classifying units into the general government and the public sector. I will explain a method with the use of a decision tree and discuss some boundary issues. How does GFSM define government? Which entities are covered? Identifying entities may seem self-evident. Obviously, the budget will qualify, the ministries and departments and the president's office, so will local and provincial governments. But what about other entities that exist at the boundaries of government? Just think of universities, public hospitals, or the local waste removal company. What about publicly owned banks? There can be tens of thousands of such entities within a single country. Clearly, defining the boundaries of a government is not always a straightforward exercise, yet the decision to include or exclude individual entities can have a significant impact on key fiscal measures, such as the deficit or surplus or the debt level. I'll now explain how GFSM defines two fiscally relevant reporting sectors, the general government sector and the public sector. The public sector is an extension of the general government sector and includes public corporations such as national airlines and post offices. The compilation of macroeconomic statistics usually starts from a register of all relevant entities. This list should be used for the compilation of GFS and for other economic statistics, such as the national accounts or balance of payments. How is this list established and how are the units classified into one or the other sector? This can be illustrated best by using a decision tree. Let's look at the path along this tree and its four main decision nodes. By answering the questions along the path, all units can be classified in a systematic way. The first step is to delineate the economy from the rest of the world. How do we decide whether a unit is resident or rest of the world? GFSM applies international standard concepts for this. Two aspects are relevant. The definition of an economic territory and the ties that a unit has to that territory. The economic territory is not the same as the physical boundaries of a country. Rather, it is, broadly speaking, the area under the control of a single government. It includes areas controlled by the government in other countries, such as embassies or military bases, and special economic zones, such as free trade areas. If a unit has its strongest ties to that territory, GFSM speaks of the center of economic interest. It qualifies as a resident. The next question is whether an entity is something statisticians call an institutional unit. Institutional units are the statistical building blocks of the economy. An institutional unit is defined by the fact that it can own assets, incur liabilities on its own behalf, independently engage in economic activities and contracts, and compile a full set of accounts. This usually means it will have a legal identity and has been formally established as, for example, a company, a charity, or an entity established by legislation. The decision criteria will help to assess whether an institutional unit has a sufficient degree of economic autonomy. If, for example, an entity has no control over key business decisions, it will not be considered an institutional unit, but rather it will be treated as an integral part of the unit that controls it, perhaps the local government. Once we have identified an institutional unit, let's determine whether this unit fits into the general government sector, the public sector, or the rest of the economy. Two further questions arise. First, is the institutional unit controlled directly or indirectly by a government? Only government controlled units can be defined as part of the general government or the public sector. Control refers to the ability to determine a unit's general policy program or business plan. It is not the same as ownership. Governments don't have to own an entity to be able to control it. GFSM provides a number of indicators of control. These include ownership, but also include the ability to appoint directors, control through regulation or through funding. In some cases, a single indicator may be sufficient to establish control. But most often, all indicators will have to be assessed collectively. Borderline cases often require careful judgment. All institutional units controlled by the government comprise the public sector. As mentioned earlier, the public sector is split into two main sections, the general government sector and bodies referred to as public corporations. The final node on the decision tree enables us to make this distinction. Is an institutional unit 
a market or non-market producer. Market producers are classified as public corporations. Non-market producers are classified as part of the general government sector. The process of drawing this line is referred to as the market-non-market -market test. A central feature of market production is the prices charged for goods and services sold are considered economically significant. This means that at minimum, producers will set and adjust prices at a level that will allow them to sustain themselves over the long run. Purchasers of these goods and services may change their consumption decisions on the basis of the price. In common economic terms, the producer operates in a market whereby prices affect supply and demand. Government units most often offer their goods and services for free or at prices substantially below the cost of delivering them, funded by taxes. This is a clear case of non-market production because pricing does not affect the level of goods and services government will supply. Public corporations, however, usually sell goods and services to consumers, often in competition with privately owned firms. Yet these companies often receive financial or other support from the government. Deciding whether a government-controlled airline, bus company, railway or recreation centre is a market or non-market producer requires an analysis of their income and expenditure. GFSM also provides specific guidance for more complex cases such as public-private partnerships and national investment corporations. By following these four steps in a systematic way, all units can be classified into a fiscally relevant sector. In practice, this is a major endeavour requiring judgment, expertise and resources. However, a sound institutional unit classification is key to ensuring that the government finance statistics and other macroeconomic statistics are comprehensive and useful and that data can be compared internationally. Let's recap. Using the decision tree, we can decide whether an entity is a resident unit, whether it qualifies as an institutional unit, whether it is within the public sector and whether it's a market or non-market unit. This is how we determine which units belong to the general government sector and the public sector. One down, 9,999 to go.